Welcome to Book. My name is Brigitte Weber. Today I have the pleasure to present additive secrets of controlling performance properties. So what is that about? I would like to give you a little bit of an insight into the world of polysiloxanes, properties that can be achieved, the chemistry, how to use them, and a little bit about troubleshooting, small hints and indications that could make your daily life easier. Now, polysiloxanes are very versatile additive chemistry. Um, a lot of properties are related to surface additives and the mainly used additive group are polysiloxanes and that is leveling properties, of course, substrate wetting, improvement of scratch resistance, and the crater properties, foam control, by choosing the right additive, but also surface slip, or as we call it, reduction of COF. Now, to understand how polysiloxanes work, I think it's good to have a small insight on the chemistry. So we have the D-missile backbone, uh, SEO backbone with the D-missile structure. And uh, this little unit here um, is the so-called D-missile group that provides the typical silicone properties. So you get reduction of surface tension and increase of surface slip, which is the same like reduction of COF. The higher amount of the d groups you have in a polymer, the stronger is the silicone. So if we look at that, if you have only a few units, and that means not so many d groups, your product is mainly focusing on wetting and leveling. If you increase the amount of D-missile group, then you get products which give you good surface slip. They're already good anti-crater additives and they provide substrate wetting. If you increase that even more, you have deformers. You need powerful, long, strong molecules for that. If you increase it more, then these are the so-called products used for hammer tone. And um, if we look at the structure here, you see the pure, I call it silicon oil. There is no organic modification in that molecule. Book does not use these kind of structures. Book is using organically modified um, demisite polysiloxanes. And the organic modification is basically giving you the compatibility in your coding system because that SEO backbone is relatively paint incompatible. It moves very fast to the interface liquid air. And by using a good organic modification, you can adjust the polarity and the compatibility in your coating system. So the mainly used modification is polyether. Polyether is nice because you can adjust the solubility, waterborne, solvent borne, by changing um, the structure. Um, or polyether modification has one drawback. It's the thermostability. If you use it in baking systems with um, baking temperature um, higher than 150 degrees, around 10, 20 minutes, then it might crack here and you get a reactive product which cross-links to your coating system and you run into problems with recoatability. So for systems that have um, higher baking temperatures, you can use a more thermostable modification that would be aracyl or also polyester. They are thermostable up to 220, 240 degrees Celsius, also at this baking time of 10, 20 minutes. Sometimes reactivity is wanted because sometimes you have applications where you want cross-linking and where you want to have products with a little bit more durability and a longer effect, then you use something with a reactive group. So pretty common is OH reactivity, but also acrylic functionality for UV systems can be used or epoxy functionality for epoxy systems. Now, use as much as possible and to get the best effect is not really wanted with silicones. We have to say, use as much as necessary because silicones can have a side effect, what we talk about later on. So not every silicone 
is a demethyl polysiloxan and um, can reduce the surface tension as much as possible. Sometimes we use products with a longer alkyl chain, so it's called um, methyl alkyl polysiloxan. And uh, you see an example here that's just um, just an exemplary example. So if we would use a demethyl group, then maybe you could reduce the surface tension with a molecule down to 21 millinewton per meter. But if you increase that alkyl chain to a longer chain length, then you can only reduce to 26 millinewton per meter or only to 32 millinewton per meter. So you can adjust the strength of a polysiloxan by adjustment of the alkyl chain. So that means it's possible to modify products in every direction, waterborne, solventborne, reactive, non-reactive, strong, not so strong. And the products we are talking about now in the following pages are really products which are used for wetting, leveling, surface slip, anti crater properties, and so on. So in this rather compatible lower molecular weight range. Now, if we look at this chart here, then um, we have classified the products. On the left side, you see the surface tension reduction. So here on the top, you see products which are strong silicones. They give a very strong reduction of surface tension. You get anti-crater properties. You get sub good substrate wetting. Whereas if you look at the bottom here, the products here on the lower side, they don't reduce the surface tension so much. That means maybe a little bit anti-crater, a little bit substrate wetting, but the main focus is that you have really good um, leveling properties and a really good visual appearance. Here on this axis, you see here low polar products, that means for lower polar paint systems. And here are products with a higher polarity, that means for higher polar paint systems or waterborne systems. And now if we, we look at the cluster, that means on the top right, there are products which are the highest efficient polysiloxans regarding anti-cratering. They give good leveling and higher dosages leveling might not be so good because the surface tension reduction is so strong that you lose uh, the tension in the surface and they don't look so good for leveling anymore. They are polar, they, they are very good in waterborne systems, but they can stabilize foam because of their high polarity and high effectiveness. If you look on the top left, then you have basically the same properties like on the right side, but because the products itself are, le are more unpolar, uh, you have less impact on foam stabilization. In the middle, you have an all over good balance of properties. So that means uh, medium crater prop anti crater properties, medium substrate wetting, very good leveling, little or no impact on foam stabilization. And if you go to the bottom, here on the right side, excellent leveling properties. No, I would say not much anti-crater properties and then no impact on foam. Easy to recode here on the top. Recodability might be an issue. And if you go to the bottom left, then you have unpolar, not so active prop, uh, products and they could even be a deformer. So products which give leveling, deforming, a good overall performance, not so strong in anti crater, not so much slip. Yeah, and explaining all that, I move to the overview and I don't explain every product, it just gives you an overview. First of all, you see some black and some purple products. So the purple products are all silicone, which were purified and they contain a cyclic siloxan content below 0.1%, that means they are EU rich compliant. They are no substance of very high concern and they are the actual modern version. The black ones are the old versions, so they are containing a cyclic siloxan content above 0.1% and they are labeled with substance of very high concern. Depends what you do, which one you can use, but you have an option here. Some products don't contain 
cyclic siloxanes, or I, I can't say that, they contain below 0.1% cyclic siloxanes, so they are also purple. Then in the green buttons is everything you can use in water and solvent borne systems, and therefore quite universal products here. The black buttons are only for solvent borne products. If you have a star, then you have products which are thermostable, suitable for higher temperature baking systems, like our Book 310 or this here. Um, the star without filling and also the circle without filling, these are really products which defoam as well. So that means if you look for an anti-crater product, you are here at the upper end. If you look for a really good leveling agent, you are here in the middle. If you need something to defoam, then look here in this area on the bottom. So it gives you a nice overview uh, for product selection for the purpose of your need in the lab. Now, when should you add a silicone? I say in the mill base, don't do it, please, because they can stabilize foam. You can have a microfoam formation because during the grinding of pigments, you grind the foam bubbles into mini foam bubbles and uh, you have a really nice mousse, which you can never deform at the end and you need to use too much additive in the formulation. So it's better not to use it in the mill base. Use a wetting and dispersing additive in the mill base and then check how does your paint perform and then add the surface active ingredient the polysiloxan at the end of the production process. So that means in the letdown phase, add it with medium shear force or as a post additive. So that means if you have a problem, craters or something, and you need to repair something, you can post add silicones to your formulation, but you also should be sure, make sure that you have enough time and um, shear force or medium shear force uh, for incorporation to be sure that you have a good distribution of the molecules in your coating system. Uh, we have a nice example here how different um, silicones work. This is a um, two-pack polyurethan system, a clear coat, and we added um, different additives in a dosage of 0.1% active silicone on total formulation. Um, the samples were incorporated on one day and then we left them overnight and for this test they were put in a paint shaker and they were shaken for 30 seconds and then we put them in a row and after one minute we took a picture and what you see is the foam and in the control you see it quite well so after one minute the foam has already started to defoam so the bottom of the glass is clear and here you see microfoam and if you compare that to other silicones, you see most of the very active silicones have a little bit foam stabilization. That's nothing to be worried about. You can control it in the formulation. But if you do, for example, um, spray application and you really have microfoam, then it's better to choose a product like Book 3760, which has less impact on foam from the beginning because of that nice chemical composition and uh, you have a strong anti crater product and good substrate wetting and not so much foam in your formulation so that you don't need to use such a high of deformer at the end. Now a lot of people say oh, if I use a silicone I have craters. I don't like that but if you have craters in the product I would always think about why do you have craters and where do the craters come from? Because there are a lot of reasons why you could have craters. Here, it's a two-pack PU system, solvent born, and it doesn't contain a surface additive. So here you have really insufficient substrate wetting. And in this case, um, by adding silicones, and we did a ladder study, so you always try different dosage and different products to find the right one by choosing the right additive. In this case, it was 0.3% Book 307 or the low cyclic siloxan version, the Book 3762. Uh, you find excellent substrate wetting and leveling. And it looks different, but it's actually the same paint. 
just a photo, we took a photo with the reflection of a lamp here. And you see the difference, the nice DOI, the clear image by using silicone. Then if you have cratering, you might not have the right dosage, as I said before. And uh, this example is also a two-pack clear coat, two-pack PU clear coat. And here we have a control. Um, here we use 0.1%, 3762, 0.3%, 3762. Um, and then um, we have here 0.1%, 3764, and 0.3%, 3764. And you see the difference, 3762 in this system is not so effective. So this is not the right additive to solve the problem. 3764 is better. And in this case, in a little bit higher dosage, and maybe you need even a little bit more than that to solve the problem. Yeah. So it depends what, what you have, what you do, especially when you change the solvent blend, for example, you might need to change also your surface additive. And um, what are the good test procedures? Um, as I said before, use as much additive as necessary. Not as much as possible would be good for our sales, but not good for your formulation. So try different products to find out which one fits best to your system. And try at least two additive dosages to find the optimum dosage to your system. And when you use polysiloxans, um, whatever you do, I would always do a glass panel application to check the compatibility of the additive in your system. If you find Kratos, it might be too incompatible and you might not want to use it. Um, do a foam test to see if the polysiloxan has an impact on foam. And um, if you do airless application, I'm sorry, but you have to spray it because in a drawdown or another test, you'd never see the right result because in airless, the air is actually dissolved at the nozzle. And then when you spray it, this, all this microphone came, so, comes out. So please do a foam test. And don't forget to do a temperature storage test. We recommend, depending on your resin, 50 degrees for one or two weeks in the beginning, just to see if the product is stable in the formulation or if you have craters after storage, maybe it's too incompatible and floats to the surface. So that's also a very important test. And then if you have craters and you use a deformer, especially in waterborne, but it also could happen in solvent borne, then maybe the silicone is not a troublemaker. Maybe the deformer is not uh, incorporated well enough, or you have a too strong deformer for the shear force, which you can apply in your production. So maybe in the lab, it looks good. In the production, the shear force is lower. So a deformer can also cause this kind of um, craters, and it can be the real troublemaker. So make sure that you use the right code deformer for your system, that you have enough shear force to incorporate it um, to avoid this kind of trouble. And then if you have seedings, sometimes seedings, sometimes not, it can also be the deformer, especially in waterborne systems. Um, when a deformer is using hydrophobic particles, it might come to a separation within the additive, and that's always indicated on the label on the drum, if that's not homogenized properly enough and you by chance you add the bottom part and not mixing it before, it could not look good. So make sure that you check the labels of your additives, make sure you homogenize them before use, and um, then you can be sure that you always find the same And what happens if a coating shows poor leveling or orange peel? Could have different uh, factors could lead to that. First of all, if you find like here, uh, poor leveling, it could be the wetting and dispersing additive. So your defloculation, especially when you use organic pigments, it might not be defloculated enough. Um, it might be that the solvent blend is not really nice, or it might be that you have a too low surface tension and you need to add something which um, is more a leveling agent, that means a silicone that is not so strong. 
A nice example here is a polyaspartic system. Here, the difference is only the leveling agent or the silicone. Here, we don't use any silicone. And here, we use 0.1%, book 3 to 7, which gives excellent leveling in polyaspartic systems. And then sometimes, you really need to check what the problem is. In this case, it's very interesting because um, two drums, drum lids, and one looks really okay, a good leveling, and the other one looks really horrible and with the same paint. So here, the problem was not the paint, the problem was the substrate. There were different, maybe different batches of uh, steel or one was not so clean. And here, this one had a lower surface tension. So when the paint was sprayed over it, it didn't really wet the substrate. So the key was here to adjust the coating so that you have a good, um, a good leveling and a good substrate wetting. So here the, the solution was to add a little bit stronger silicone so that you not only um, have a good substrate wetting of the goods or the easier to wet lid, but also here. So that means substrate wetting. You get substrate wetting if the surface tension of your coating is equal or lower than the surface tension of your substrate. And here the problem was it was not low enough and by lowering it the result was very good. So what is the takeaway of my little lecture here? Um, polysiloxans provide excellent paint properties. They can give you leveling, anti-crater properties, good substrate wetting, good scratch resistance, good deforming. One product does not fit all. The right product selection is essential for success. Dosage and incorporation of polysiloxans is a key point for success. So never add it to the mill base. Make sure you have enough time for incorporation of the additives and you use the same conditions in the lab and in the production and use medium to sh lower shear forces for incorporation. When you evaluate polysiloxans, have a look at various properties, check the compatibility, check the foam behavior, check the storage stability and check the behavior with your application method and check the impact of your deformer on surface properties as well. Thank you very much for listening to me. And if you have questions or if you would go into further discussion or if you need a recommendation, please feel free to go send your email to tutorials.book at altana.com or directly to me if you know me. Thank you very much and bye bye.